Yep. All right. Uh, we are going to finish up the Gospel of Luke today. Yay! I only got one yay, so I guess some of you still are wanting me to continue to preach through it, so I guess we'll, we'll, we'll break the last couple of verses up in just a few more small sections. No? Okay, probably not. Um, let's uh, open up in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your great salvation. Father, if you, if you had not loved us, Father, with the love that you have for us, um, we would have been hopelessly lost in sin. Father, I thank you that we get to see who you are. We see it in um, the redemption that your son accomplished for us. So I thank you for that. It gives um, great hope and trust and love for you. I just ask Father that your glory would go throughout all the earth. Yeah. I ask your blessings upon our time as we study your word. May it be good, may it be fruitful, may there be power for God for salvation. And I would ask this, Father, in the name of your Son Jesus. Amen. So today we are ending our section in the story of uh, Luke. We are finishing up Luke, Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Um, we are going to, um, I will probably mention this again, in our passage you will see that Jesus mentions that um, the scriptures in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms speak about him. I think after uh, Luke is done, we'll probably go through some of those um, uh, pictures of Jesus in the law, the prophets, and in the Psalms, just to catch a glimpse of what the Old Testament is uh, sharing with us. And then ultimately, our long term goal is we're going to be going to the gospel, or the, gospel the epistle of Colossians next. So that's where we're, that's ultimately where we're going. Okay. Um, so today is really the good news of salvation. Uh, John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, um, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, I was thinking about. Uh, the message of salvation, and I, I, I'm amazed as how I continue to change over the course of time. I, uh, my sisters used to love the book and the, the six-volume uh, video series of Pride and Prejudice, and uh, there was no way that you could get me as a young boy to watch such a girly show, right? And now I seem to have a tendency to watch it more frequently than my guy shows. Uh, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what that says about me. Uh, one of the things I probably love about that story, though, is uh, in, in the story, um, obviously the main character, I can't remember his name right now, but Darcy, Darcy, uh, you can tell that he has uh, fallen in love with Elizabeth. And uh, of course, it's not the greatest relationship how things are going on. And the one sister has run off, and the consequence of that back in the time that they lived in was that um, all the girls, all the other sisters were now tarnished, and um, he was not going to be able to marry the woman that he loves. And so Darcy sets off to find the daughter who has run off and to make sure that she marries the guy that she has run off with, and uh, he pays for all of her debts or all of the man's debts, and it's quite an amazing story, and um, towards the end, and when asked, uh, you know, why, why you did it, he says, don't you know, it was all for you. And, uh, I did it for you. And that's what I think of when I think of the story and of the message of salvation and where we're at. Why did God do it? He did it for us. Because he loved us, it testifies to his very nature and his character. Why did he pay our debt? The debt that we could not pay. Because he loved us. He wanted to be with us. That was what his plan and desire was from the very beginning of creation. That the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, would walk on earth with the people that he made. That we would know him and see him face to face. But we'd incurred a debt. We'd incurred a debt of sin. And the consequence of sin is death. No man can pay that debt and live. 
if all have partaken of sin. So God did the only thing that was possible to save us. He sent his one and only son. Who did not sin. Which is truly amazing. To have lived in this world and not sin. And then to die in your place and my place. So that you and I could know forgiveness of sins. Amen. And uh, it all speaks to the glory of the Father. It speaks of his great love for us. It um, tells us what he desires. That God, more than anything, wants a relationship with you. He is also a holy and righteous God. And he cannot have a relationship with sinners. So he had to get, fix the problem. And he did that through his son. And so today, we are ending the Gospel of Luke with the good news of salvation. And so Luke chapter 24, 44 through 53, we're going to read it and then um, go through it, talk about some of the things in it. So if you will, Luke chapter 24, 44 through 53. It says, Now he said to them, that is to his disciples, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witness of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising God. So we're going to start off our section and just notice that in verses 44 through 45, that all things written about Jesus must be fulfilled. It says this, and we will read it again. And he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you. you got to love that Jesus says, you know, everything that was in the Bible, I was telling you the whole time while I was with you. Almost like, why didn't you get it? Okay. That all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. It says, then he opened their minds to understand Scripture. Um, one of the things that for me has just been a, a good continue of my confidence in God's salvation is to continue to look at the testimony of Scripture. That it is not only just a, it is a coherent Think about how much time the Bible was written over and how many authors wrote it. To think that they maintain one coherent thought, to me, is a wonderful testimony. And then the other thing, I think, which is what is today, is that God wrote down everything that he said he was going to do. And then he did it. Right? How many of you have people in your life that they tell you they're going to do something, and then they never do it? can't say that about God. He wrote in advance the things that he was going to do. And then he fulfilled it. He stayed true to his word. And how do you know that, that the scriptures, in a sense, are the word of God? Well, God said what he was going to do, and then we can see in his son that he actually did it. He accomplished it. Right? You and I, you can, we can sometimes go back in our Old Testament and read things and go, no, that's really about Jesus. Um, if, you, if you'd read those passages before Jesus came, you might have looked at them and said, how is he going to fulfill all that? And yet when you read his life and you read the story, you realize how he has done it. Right? And so one of the things I guess it just continues to testify to me is right that uh, I have this in your notes, 2 Timothy 3.16, that the scriptures really are the inspired word of God. And then Romans 3 2, uh, Romans 3 2 says that they are the oracles of God. God told us in advance what he was going to do so that we could know him, so that when he actually did it and accomplished it, we would recognize it. So, yeah, 
The scriptures are the word of God, and I love that God speaks in advance to the things that he is going to do. Now, in verses 46 through 49, we pick up the message. We're going to pick up the message of the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Everything, right, that they have been teaching, Jesus is going to tell us, right, and the message goes as this. What is the message from God? Uh, verse 46 says it this way. Uh, that it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. So what was the message that the Bible was preaching the whole time? That the Messiah was going to suffer and he was going to rise from the dead on the third day. That assumes a lot of things. Why do you need a Messiah? Because you're sinners. And he needed a God to send someone to save you. What is he going to do? He is going to suffer. He is going to be the sacrifice that is going to take away sin. He is going to bear the, bear the penalty of your sin. And then, right, and then after that, because of his own righteousness, because of his own innocence, because of the fact that he, in fact, is the Son of God, and that life dwells in him, that he was the life, of, uh, he is the light of all men. He's going to rise from the dead on the third day. So that's the message. Okay? That's what we learned in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's the simple message. The scripture said he was going to die. He was going to be buried. He was going to rise from the dead on the third day. That was the message. What does that message mean? What does that story mean? Well, we pick that up in the next verse, verse 47. Right? 47 um, says this, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. What does the story mean? That means that through repentance you can experience the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. Right? Repentance is a change of mind. Okay? You can look at your life and go, my life is not heading in a good direction. All the things that I am doing are causing me to suffer. I need something to change me, to redeem my life. Right? They're, they're calling out to God in repentance. And what does a person need more than anything? The thing that people, all people need is to experience the forgiveness of sins. The Bible just assumes we're all sinners. That's a starting point. If that wasn't the starting point, there would have been a different message of salvation. The Bible just assumes all people are sinners. All people are in need of forgiveness of sin. And that is what God wanted to do. He wanted to forgive you and I. Why did Jesus suffer and rise on the third day? So that through repentance we could have the forgiveness of sins right, in the name of Jesus Christ. And the beauty of that salvation is everything holds fast and everything holds firm and everything holds true in Jesus. God only asks in one sense of you and I of one thing, that we continue to keep our trust in his son. Yes, his son will change us and will cause us to do good works, but the thing that God asks more than anything is that everything we would trust his son we trust his son for our lives. Because he is the one who has lived a perfect life. That is what the story means. For whom is the message? It's for everyone. Right? That this message is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. The message was always for all people. It wasn't a message just for Israel, the Jews, the sons of Abraham, it was for all people. Right? God is the creator of heaven and earth, and what he went to do was to redeem all of the earth, all of life. The message is for everyone. So who will the message work for? It will work on all people. Do you believe that? Because if we believe it, we'll share it, right? Leave it, we'll live it out. The message of forgiveness is for all people. How will the message be taken out into the whole world? By the power.
power of the Spirit of God. Verse 49. It says, Behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. How is the message of forgiveness of sins to be taken to the world? It is through the power of the Spirit of God. God is going to do something. God has, in fact, done something that is unique. He has put his Spirit upon all believers. Okay? So the Spirit is going to empower the messengers. The disciples, even though they have known the truth, they cannot take the truth out into the world until the Holy Spirit has come upon them. God is Spirit, and the message has to go out in the power of the Spirit. Right? So the only way you and I can share the message is one, you and I have to be filled with the Spirit of God first. Okay? We have to be changed. Okay? The Spirit has to be able to take the message out. Have you ever been to an evangelistic crusade? I remember I've been to a number of them. Uh, I was at a Promise Keepers once um, at uh, the Oakland Coliseum. And I don't remember what day it was, but I was, um, uh, obviously, I mean, you're in the stadium listening to, um, to the men speak, and they brought up one evangelist, and he preached for like maybe 10 minutes the most simplest message I have ever heard. And then he just called for the men. He says, who wants to become saved, right? And all of a sudden, the men just get up out of their seat, and they start flooding forward. I was going, what? My dad just looks at me and goes, well, that has to be the Spirit of God, because that message was too simple. <laughs> the Spirit of God has to take the message out. We give the words, but the Spirit of God has to go forth with the message. Okay. It has to move on the hearts and lives of men and women. Okay. So you and I need the Spirit of God to take the message out. And two, right, the Spirit has to actually accomplish salvation. Because if we are sinners and in need of repentance, in need of a change of mind, God is the only one who can actually change our hearts. I think I've said this to you many times now, especially in recent days. I sometimes am amazed at how my thinking is very different than the world, and I'm always trying to think of why the world doesn't think the way I think. Glad some of you laughed at that, right? But I, I kind of think, remind myself, the only reason I think the way I think is because God has actually changed me. Would I think the way I do now without the Spirit of God having transformed my life? I wouldn't be. God did the most amazing thing. This is what the Spirit of God promises to do. He will change your desires. He will change the way you think. Sin captures you. It enslaves you. That's why you can't stop. That's why you can't get out of it. You are a slave to it. You need someone to set you free. You need someone to change your heart and your desire. In fact, you and I cannot walk out the ways of God outside of the Spirit of God coming in and changing you. How will the message be taken out? Be taken out of the spirit of power of the Spirit of God. And that's God's promise to you, beloved, if you don't know him. Maybe you're thinking, okay, I can understand the message of salvation, but how is it actually going to change you? The promise is God is going to put his spirit inside of you and he will change you. So you can actually begin to you know, walk out in his ways. He is going to change you. You will simply trust in him. We end with verses 50 through 53, and you get the testimony of the ascension. Um, Luke just gives us a really short and condensed version. Right? If you want a fuller version, you can go read a little bit more of Acts chapter 1. Um, you can also read uh, some of the tail end of the Gospel of John. But uh, Luke is just kind of closing things up, so it's just kind of a really nice condensed version. Um, the testimony of the ascension is a wonderful thing, and we'll just read it again. It says this, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. 
And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. So just a, I wrote down two things. I probably could have written down more, but I was actually running out of space on your notes. So that's how life goes. Okay. Uh, um, the testimony of the ascension is a wonderful thing because it tells us that Jesus, in fact, beyond the resurrection, that Jesus has been accepted to the right hand of the Father. Okay. Uh, you have the resurrection, which tells us that God was satisfied with Christ's sacrifice, right? And that he raised him up, that he accomplished everything. But that's also what the ascension does, too. That Christ, has, his, his atoning work has been accepted. And he has now entered into his glory. And so the great joy for you and I is, we know that Jesus has been accepted, and that because Jesus has been accepted and we trust in Jesus, we too will be accepted. We know the one that we are trusting in has been accepted by the Father, and therefore we know that we are also accepted because of the one we have trusted in. So the ascension is a wonderful, wonderful testimony. Will God accept you for putting your trust in Jesus? The ascension says, absolutely. You have that firm assurance of salvation. And the second thing, uh, which comes out in the last part of the verse, right, is that they worshipped Jesus. Right? They worshipped Jesus. Think about what you believe in Judaism. Who's the only one you can worship? The only one you can worship is God. Men see angels and they fall down. And the angels say, don't worship me. Who's the only one that you can worship? The only one you can worship is God. And yet, who did the disciples worship? They worship Jesus. Why? Because he is God. Because in fact, he is God's one and only son. So here they are, they are worshiping him, right, and they are continually in the temple praising God. So they are maintaining, in essence, uh, Judaism's understanding of who is God. God is the creator of heaven and earth, and they are also in his temple worshiping Jesus. So when we go through our Bible, right, we go through our New Testament, who at all times, who is Jesus? He is God's one and only Son, and what did he do? He is also the main one who brought this world into existence. Right? Right after the Gospel of John, I mean Gospel of Luke, you have the Gospel of John. How does John open up? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. What does that mean? He created all things. If you are the creator, what are you? You're God. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And here we are, beloved. This is the good news of the salvation. Why do we go through the whole Gospel of Luke? It tells us some of the wonderful stories of Jesus' teaching. It tells us of his life, but at the end, it is the message that brings salvation. Is the message that brings salvation to love. I can only ask and plead that you would put your trust in his son. God promises that if you put your trust in his son, he will be the one who will change you. That is his promise. He will put his spirit inside you. He will change your desires. He is the one who will accomplish forgiveness. He will allow you to experience that forgiveness. I've experienced the forgiveness of God over and over again in my life. I'm ashamed to say that I have sinned over and over again in my life. I am forever grateful that the blood of Jesus continues to forgive and to cleanse. I'm forever grateful that the Spirit of God
continues to transform me. He promises that he will, in fact, do the same for you. But you have to call him. He will see you. You will have a strong testimony of the Spirit of God. You have a strong testimony of his ascension. There we end. The Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Life. Let's pray. Father, you are the only one who can save us. You promised that you would do it. Promise, Father, that one day you would send your spirit and you did it. So, Father, we have a strong assurance that, Lord God, um, when you say your son will return, we can trust that he will, in fact, return. So, Father, I just ask that um, today, um, here, or in, in the future, that you'll be working in people's lives, Lord God, that people will cry out to you. They will hear the good news of salvation. They will put their trust in you. And I ask, Father, that you will continue to fill your word. Fill your word. You will save them, Lord God, and you will put your spirit inside them. So, Lord, may it be on the day that they call out to you that they will experience the power of your salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and the new life that comes with the spirit. I ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.